Hey everyone, welcome to Med Mentors Weekly Clinic that we have live for you today. Um, so I'm here to answer your questions about everything to do with medical school applications, um, to do with medicine, to do with medical school um, and to do with um, life in the NHS and as a future doctor. So please feel free to drop your questions below. We have our weekly clinic every Saturdays, 6 to 7 p.m. Today we've started a little bit early um, just because we're going to head off a little bit earlier than usual. Um, but yeah, so to start off, my name is Tafsir. I'm a final year medical student at UCL and um, I am also a ex-UCL interviewer for medical school. And I um, uh, and I've also done uh, I've also carried out men, uh, been part of the mentoring program at UCL for um, people in year 12s and 13s to help them get into med school for the last six years. Presented loads of summer schools about how to get into med school and the best ways to do so. So I've got a few hints or tricks um, up my sleeves for that. So feel free to drop your questions below and I'll try my best to answer them. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Keep them coming. So in the last few weeks, we've, um, so this is, I think, our 13th, 14th live session. So um, we've had this on for the last few months and we've answered loads of questions. We're starting from things like what should you have on your personal statement um, and what things should you go for for work experience and volunteering to things like UCAT and BMAP prep that we've um, spoken about in previous live sessions. So if you do have questions on those things, feel free to look at our earlier recordings. They're all on our Med Mentor um, Instagram, like um, Instagram uh, social media account. And we've got loads of things on our website, loads of blog posts, um, loads of things about how to get into med school, what are the best resources to use, everything free, because um, uh, um, everyone in the Med Mentor team want to make this as accessible to you guys as possible. Um, and hence why we'd like you guys to share us with as many of your friends and people that you know are applying to med school um, as you have. So yeah, that's it. So yeah, do drop your questions below, either in the comment sections or in the quest on the quest cards, and they'll be happy to help. So best tips for preparing for the UCAT books, question banks, etc. So this is a very common question. Your local aspiring medic, um, nice little handle. Um, we we at Med Mentor actually talk a lot about Medify, and um, we uh, so because Medify has been said to said to us to be a really good. Uh, resource and question bank. Um, I know plenty of mentees of mine that used them in previous years and got very decent scores um, and they used them very well and like worked hard with that so that was really helpful for them. Um, other things that we'd obviously look at are the standard books out there for UCAT whether that be from Kaplan or um, for the ISC books um, but the web on the website the UCAT website they have past papers that are very very representative of the UCAT exam itself Definitely look at the UCAT website to find out about the way the exam is going to be structured, the type of questions coming up. There's mock papers that you might want to leave until close to the time of the exam for you to answer. Um, and they are really good because they're online and that's how you would do their actual exam. Quite representative. Um, and the other thing with that is every year the UCAT does tend to change every like with this or that, like being added or every other year. So definitely stay up to date with any, any of the new updates on the UCAS syllabus because I know when I did it a couple of years back now um, things have changed with a few added sections and added types of questions as well so yeah um, that's my that's my general tips your local aspiring medic please get back to me if you have any follow-up questions all right so I've got a question from um, I provide um, Ibrevise, sorry, I've got that completely wrong. Um, so um, Ibrevise goes, planning to apply to UCL Medicine, any tips? Well, that's a very generic question. First of all, I'd say yes, um, do apply. Do apply to Medicine at UCL. It's a really amazing course um, and it's a top institute. I think it's like ninth best in the world or something on the rankings or 10th, don't quote me on that anymore. Um, but I think more than that, I think um, UCL is really great for being in central London. Um, and having kind of that uh, that university and city atmosphere simultaneously, which is really good because you've got med schools all around all around you, like King's and Queen Mary and Imperial and like St George's and all of these guys. Like it's it's a I think it's a 
good place to be a student in general. Um, and then the second thing about all of this is that UCL Medicine itself is very much a traditional course. So if you are looking for something like that, definitely um, look to uh, look for UCL. And the reason why I say these advantages, is because the tips that when it comes to interview is that you really need to do your research and homework on UCL and what it provides and what it can promise you as a future medical student, because then they'll know that you were looking into this like quite well. Um, any tips in general? I say the main tips would be to try your best on acing the BMAT. I think um, you very you, these days you need a very, very good BMAT score um, as part of your entire application to get an interview. And that is the hardest part of getting into UCL is getting that interview in the first place. I think when it comes to interviews, like in the last few years, I think it's been 600 people get interviews, two and a half thousand to 3,000 apply, and then about 400 or 380 people get offers or something. So it's all about getting that interview, maximizing the points in your personal statement by making sure you do the right volunteering, the right work experiences, and then you're able to, when it comes to an interview, actually talk about that very well because they do look at your experiences and they do ask about them. And it's all about you kind of reflecting on those experiences and what you found from it. It's not like you need to be a new, you need to, like, it's got nothing to do with you um, shadowing like a neurosurgeon in a hospital, in a tertiary hospital. It's like nothing to do with that. We're looking at things like if you're volunteering in a charity shop or you're working at a part-time job, like what are you taking from that? And that's the important things that they're looking for. Um, uh, a few of the words that they like using are things like resilience. They want to see that you'll be able to cope in such a um, such a difficult, which I'm not going to lie, it is. It's a very difficult and stressful six year course. There's a lot um, chucked at you in terms of content and things that you need to learn. At the same time, they want you to be able to contribute to university society. Um, and you and they want to look for a UCL doctor, which means someone who's got personality, good communication skills. Um, and by the time you've got an interview, you already they already know you're clever enough. That's why you've got the interview. They're now caring about your personal personality and what type of doctor you're going to be. They want someone not to be a scientific, like just a purely scientific doctor. They want that scientific basis for research and things like that and clinical acumen. But they really want that communication skill so you can talk to that patient and relate to them. And that's what they want to see in little glimpses coming across in the actual interview itself. Um, improvise. Um, I hope that has helped. But my first um, and tip for you, I'm guessing at your stage, is try your best to ace that BMAT. Um, and yeah, good luck. Good luck with ap applying. All right, guys, keep your questions coming in. Improvise, you're very welcome. Good luck with all of it. I'm glad. If you have any other further questions for any university stuff in general, Feel free to drop them below, not just UCL, but any of the others as well. I'm happy to answer them. Okie dokie. So um, in the last few sessions, we've had interesting conversations about things like um, things like uh, podcasts to listen to, books to read um, for like kind of giving you that alternative to work experience and volunteering when it comes to finding yourself, uh, finding out about med med school and, and medicine in general. So that's um, that's one thing. Um, Ujwa, that's a good question. So what is the course structure like at UCL? Um, okay, so the course structure at UCL is very traditional in the fact that we are less PBL, which is problem-based learning heavy, we're more um, lecture heavy. And that comes across especially with our structures because we have two years of preclinical in the first, first and second year, where we do basically all the science behind the human body that we need to know inside out um I, on like a molecular um level slash applied to a human body um so we learn about anatomy we learn about physiology we learn about biochemistry we learn about like the statistics and maths behind it all we learn about the psych behind it all we have like um communications classes to help give us a good ground level of like how to maybe talk to a patient and things like that um so that's the first two years very science heavy very much more like Oxford and Cambridge in terms of that science heavy aspect. 
which I didn't actually realize until I got to UCL. And then in third year, you have your BSc year where you can do whichever BSc you like to do, uh, like the 50 options that we have at UCL, or you can go somewhere else. And that could be something very scientific and to a niche that you like, or it could be humanities based, or it could be maths and med tech based. Um, you can choose whichever you like, which is fine. Um, and then, um, so I personally did global health because I wanted kind of a break from medicine and wanted to do um, something that was more macro level in terms of um, medicine in general. So that was really um, good and interesting for me. And the last three years, um, you do purely clinical medicine, nothing preclinical about it. All your clinical medicine is to do with um, applying things to your patient. And that's what we have our placements for. So we have placement in fourth year for all the core specialties. And then in fifth year for the specialty specialties like OBS and gynae, pediatrics, and psychiatry along with a few other niches like ENT, derm, um, all of that stuff, urology, um, gum HIV and then in the final year you bring that all together to act and think like an F1 um, and that's um, you get you, you get your placement in a hospital site away from central London hospitals because um, medicine outside of central London is actually a little bit or quite different to central London um, especially the types of patients you come across, the services offered, and the types of doctors you come across and specialties offered as well. Um, and so, yeah, we do our final year away from London and then boom, six years gone and you're a doctor, hopefully. So um, that's what the course structure is like at UCL. Um, we all have PBL, by the way, like all universities are now required to have PBL because of the GMC saying so. Um, so you still have that PBL aspect. And I really actually enjoyed that PBL aspect because it was integrated in quite well with the clinical, with the medic, with the preclinical part. Um, you are able to contextualize like cases and that's what problem-based learning is. And you, it, and it was quite structured as in, it was after like a lecture we'd have on that topic in general. And then we'd actually have support from the lecturers who are all doctors and PhD students and stuff to help us through that problem or, or that case. Um, so yeah, it was really, um, it was really enjoyable actually doing PBL stuff. Um, and so I definitely thought that I wouldn't like PBL um, but having it in small doses really helped me. And now looking back on it, I'm not going to lie to you. I might have applied to a P more PBL universities. So yeah, it's good to see, it's good to know both sides. Hey guys, um, welcome back, another aspiring medic. Hi Roshan, nice to have you both on. Hello. Um, yeah, keep your questions coming in. I'm happy to answer them as we are. We start a little bit early because we're finishing a little bit early today. So just keep them coming thick and fast, and I'll get through them. So, Ibrevise goes book or podcast recommendations for the personal statement. Ibs, um, I tell you to go straight on to our Med Mental website where we actually got a blog post with books that we've recommended and a list of them, as well as links and podcast recommendations as well. Um, off the top of my head, there are a few um, podcasts that are quite, um, quite interesting, especially in this time. So, I think just keeping on top of current affairs in medicine in general is pretty good. I think nowadays, um, med like the medical people out there have their own niches. So whether you want to look at lifestyle health, you can look at like the food medic, she has a podcast. Um, or you, if you want to look outside of medicine, but a GP's perspective, um, there's this podcast called You Are Not A Frog or something. And like all the leadership qualities required in a clinician that they talk about and the problem skills, uh, problem solving. There's really famous guy now called um, Rangan Chachi. He has his like feel better, live more podcast and that's grown very like quite a lot and he does talk about a lot of self self-help stuff and psychology psychology and like nutrition and diet and loads and loads of things um he's now branched out to, out to but actually it's not very much medicine heavy but it just it's just more about kind of the way you live your life and i think that's pretty good um as a background um I have a few friends that have a podcast called the scrubbed in podcast and they've got that ready for um for people who want to do, uh, who want to get into med school, that especially their first um, series of episodes, um, their stories of med school in general. Um, so that'll give you an insight of how med school could be and then life as a doctor, because now they're F3s as well. Um, and yes, Sharp Scratch by Student BMJ um, was uh, something that I've just um, tuned into in the last week. So that's been very good. That's done by the official BMJ. So that's a pretty good um, podcast to look at. And I think it's quite... Um, it's quite heavily based on like medical students and slash F1s. So it's a good like pitch level to look into. Future Frontline have one too. That's great. Thank you, Roshan, for these shout outs. I'm loving it. Um, and 
I remember MSF had a podcast that I was listening to um, a couple of years back, but they might have finished off with that. But loads and loads of opportunities. Just go and listen to a few times the speed if you're not too sure about them and just give them a little taster and then just see what you can take from it. Quite interesting because I told one of my mentees who didn't, who at that point of our application didn't have too much to write about in terms of work experience. And she included like um, her listening to a food medic podcast um, and how like she actually really enjoyed um, cooking like nutritional food and stuff that like, she's like, she'd gotten interested in all that stuff in the past year. That was part of her personal statement. She then talked about it in an interview. And um, yeah, so don't underestimate the power of podcasts and media in general. Um, good. When it comes to books, oh my God, there's so many. I've mentioned so many in, in the past. Um, I read one called um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. I think another spying medic read that one too. Um, that was a really good book. That was part of my personal statement. Other things now, the classic ones are like Do Not Harm. Um, and um, the other one was um, The Guy Who's a Comedian Now. I forgot the name of the book, so I'll get back. This is going to hurt. Um, and like... Um, the other one that I recently um, listened to was The War Doctor. That was a really, really riveting kind of account and story. So that will really be good for a personal statement. He's a surgeon working on the front lines for MSF and um, worked in Syria and other and other war-torn um, places. Um, there's a lot and there's a lot out there. Choose something that you think from the blurb you find interesting because I promise you it's, it's, it's so hard to get through a book that is difficult, especially that, that you don't like, especially if it's a field that you're not used to, like medicine. So I read a book called The Emperor of All Maladies. I didn't read it. I did not read it. I went six pages in and I was just very confused because it was I was in year 12 and my scientific brain clearly couldn't handle the terms that were being used, like leukemia and stuff and moving here into stories. So I was um, I was pretty happy to just let that go and read other books. So, um, so yeah, no pressure on that at all. Cool, Ib revised. That was a good question. Um, thank you, Roshan, for helping with the answers and another spying medic. Also, how to become a doctor, becoming a doctor podcast. That's good. Thank you so much. Where can I find these podcasts? So, um, if you have um, normally, if you just type these podcasts in and write podcasts at the end of it, they have like a website that comes up, and they either they have like the free episode on a website link, you just press play, or if you have this uh, YouTube, or they might have a YouTube link where they've got that on or Spotify or like um, like SoundCloud or things like uh, Apple Music and things like that, like loads of opportunities. So most, all of them are definitely free. That's the, that's why it's great. Uh, Your Life in My Hands by Rachel Clark. Oh, wow. Uh, that sounds, that, more to a medic. Thank you for that. That sounds really good. War, War Doctor is the one I read. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's the one that we were talking about. And When Breath Becomes Air, that was the one that we spoke about a couple of episodes ago. That was nice also get all popular yeah that's great what are the podcasts called that so that that's what the podcasts were called so if you i mean this is being recorded so you can go back on to what i just said but um we've got like um blog posts on uh on lists of podcasts and books to that you could like have a look at on the med mental website under our blog post so please do check them out there um yeah cool we'll come back to blog posts and podcasts uh, maybe you guys can talk to us, uh, talk to me about something that you've listened to recently as a, as a podcast, and you're like, hmm, this is interesting. Um, uh, one, a few more that's more out there. So med tech is quite big in medicine right now, and a lot of people are thinking about it and how technology is going to impact medicine. So I think um, I started listening to the health tech podcast. Um, which was a very um, nice little podcast talking about doctors mainly and people in the medical field founding companies and technologies in that and that really introduced me to medical technologies quite well which was good cool all right more to a medic has asked me a question um, and, he, and their question is did you struggle on wards during clin clinical placements short answer to that is yes um, I did definitely struggle on wards at the beginning but I don't think I was worried about struggling um, more because I knew I was going to struggle, but I knew I'd also enjoy that because so at UCL, because of the course structure that we spoke about before, we've had three years of uh, med school without actually any clinical or patient contact. So I was itching to see patients and like help out in the clinical department and do do my learning there and see it actually applied like that is 
the most amazing part to it. I think like you read stuff on textbooks and you're like, okay, that's fine. You learn it for exams. And then when you see the thing actually applied in real life to make a difference in a patient's life, like it is pretty amazing. Um, and I'd forgotten that feeling because that's when I first saw it on my work experience when I was like in year 10. And then coming to it in fourth year of med school, I was like, right, this is why I've done it. So it was very much a good perspective change. Um, and I struggled because there's a lot to balance in your first few months of clinical placement, learning about new conditions, um, learning about how to um, approach patients and ask the right type of questions in a history, what to do in an examination. You're not really used to saying these words out loud whilst talking to a patient or a doctor. You get grilled by doctors a lot of the time. Um, and obviously it's med school, so you've got all the other things going on around you, like normal life and society things and sports and stuff. So it's um, it's like almost... So like with placement, it feels like work, like you are basically at work without getting paid, but you're learning, but you've got long hours, but then you still got to revise for your exams and pass them. And that, those exams definitely require you to do a lot of textbook work that you won't find all in all in clinical placement. So that's why it is quite heavy, but I enjoyed it um, and I'm still enjoying it. Hence why I'm here. So um, yes, I think I did struggle, um, uh, but uh, it's a very quick learning curve. I think in the first month of my clinical placement, I probably learned more than I had done in the last like three years of that medical school degree. So it is a huge learning curve and it's amazing. Um, anything you guys want to add about that? What are you guys looking forward to with clinical placements? Um, yeah, go on, go go for it. Uh, cool. Um, your local aspiring medic has asked tips on reflecting on podcasts um, or books for personal statement. Um, I definitely wrote a book summary at the end of whatever book I read with my, my reflections, my thoughts, my feelings about stuff, um, any specific points in the book that I really liked. I highlighted through my book. I destroyed my books. I'm not going to lie to you. But in the Kindle era, era, I think it's easier to do that. Um, but yeah, I destroyed my books. They were like all like had notes on stuff that I was thinking, oh, maybe I can link it to this, this, this. I highlighted through stuff. I, I folded through things because I was not going to remember this stuff. Um, and then I kind of summarized it into like a couple of page document. I think there's loads of stuff online these days about kind of like um, back then there weren't as much, but there is now like just things that summarize books in general <coughs> with like documents and like word spreads on, on, on websites. So I'd encourage you to just download those and go through them at some point um, after you've read the book as well and highlight through and annotate them. Maybe that will be easier than my tactics. So just have a look uh, with podcasts. I think it's very different because you're listening to something and so then you'd have to write things down afterwards. Um, I think just reflect on that podcast as soon as you've listened to it or at the end of the day, what you've taken from it, um, what it was roughly about and write a few notes here or there. Um, it doesn't have to be just one podcast, it could be just a series and the general gist of things that you've taken from it. Um, but yeah, so that's what I'd say. Obviously, the general tips for reflection apply. Uh, apply the... Um, uh, the format of like star situation task action um re what you've done response and like reflect on it um and like you want to make that quite clear and just think just link things because remember you're going to listen to this now but i remember when i was doing work experiences in year 11 i wasn't going to apply or get an interview for another two and a half years so i definitely wrote everything i could down so i could re-remember it in time for my interviews and personal statement which really did help so that was pretty good so Definitely do. I think we are medics will be doing book club again this year. Wow. And I found that really helpful this year to help motivate you to read more. Roshan, that's amazing. So it might be worth checking out their IG page too. Um, that sounds really good. That sounds really good. I'll definitely look into We Are. Oh, I've heard of We Are Medics. Yes, they're really good. I just didn't know they did a book club. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. So have a look on their Instagram page. Um, uh, don't worry, Roshan. We have no problems with um, promoting other pages that are amazing um, and free and help get people into med school so yeah thank you so much for that i'm sure we are medics um will be good i wish i had a book club that would have been amazing for me um you guys have so much in the social media era so that's really good uh calm 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 the next question i have is um from thank you guys for helping answering the questions as well roshan and we are medics nice to have you guys always on board um more, more to a medic goes, did you struggle on the wards during third year? That was the question that had come in. If you have any follow-up questions on that, feel free to ask. Happy to answer them. Another aspiring medic. Tasty question, as usual. What was your 
Um, what was your best experience on placement? Woo! Love making me think. Um, I think one of the best experiences of... Okay, so I think my favourite play, like placement experiences was probably a &E and GP. Um, so I was the GP... Uh, I was on GP work experience, uh, work experience, lol, placement, um, uh, in fifth year and final year. And in fifth year, I had a lot of autonom autonomy and in final year as well about kind of diagnosing patients, man managing them and like investigations and stuff like that. Obviously, all supervised and double checked with um, whichever doctor I was doing it with. So I think in uh, it was like middle of fifth year, just before the pandemic had hit. And I was running my own like doctor's clinic list. So I'd see in an afternoon my patients with like 20 minute consultation instead of 10 minutes because obviously I'm very new um, and I'd then take the history, take the examination um, and then I'd present it back to the GP that I was under and I would consult with them the investigation management plan I'll go for, they'd say yes or no and then we would move forward with it. So that was I think like that was my best placement because I was like well I, I'm a, I have autonomy I am able to actually use my clinical skills and um, do the right sort of stuff um, in terms of one single um, best experience on placement I think I will probably come back to it but I think it's a very much I think I have a lot of amazing experiences where like at the end of the day I was like wow that was a really wholesome day like I really just loved that human connection between the colleagues that were there or the patient and the patient that was there that we were helping that we we're doing things for um and that feeling of like kind of satisfaction that yeah like I didn't waste eight hours of my life on doing nothing or like it was actually useful to someone in some way and I was able to help um yeah, that was so. Th those wholesome experiences are really nice. Obviously, when the doctors talk to you like you're a human being, um, uh, and like they talk about like your life, and they you you become kind of like friends with them uh, after you're on a firm for a couple of like weeks and stuff. It's pretty nice to have that sort of vibe because I think that's what work is a lot about. It does depend a lot on the people around you and your colleagues. I think a lot of my friends who are now F ones and F twos, they do talk about their colleagues first when it comes to how's work like when I asked like how's work going because your colleagues make quite a big difference um so yeah choose your colleagues wisely especially in medicine <laughs> but yeah um I'll probably come back to it with if I have an overriding best uh, one but I hope that has helped you guys will have amazing experiences oh my god brilliant so true both please oh thank you Roshan and another spy medic love the love that you're chucking our way both pages helped uh, hi, and uh, that makes sense. I think it's really nice that when they include you as part of the MGT like you're supposed to be, definitely. Um, and you get plenty of opportunities and there actually are so many amazing doctors out there that actually care about your education and like making you a good doctor. Um, like for example, like we're all going to be doctors in the next few years. So that tells you a lot about the type of people who are going into medicine. So that makes a big difference, which is good. All right, another question I've got is from, um, MX Ladsi, so do you have any advice to for graduate entry medicine specifically preparation that can be done? That's a really good question. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of answers to graduate entry medicine. Um, so what I'd say is definitely look on our med mentor website for anything on graduate entry medicine under our blog post. And if nothing is there, there's I think loads of social media sites out there now trying to find um trying to kind of breach that gap in the market. When I spoke to graduates before, I think it's just the exams really do matter. Getting the experience in hospitals and volunteering and part-time jobs and things like that, like they actually matter. It's just like applying for medical school, but more competitive compared to like year 12 and 13 um, in general. And obviously all the minimum entry requirements are on everyone's website. So I don't really have any specific advice. I'm sorry about that. Um, I think it would be probably unjust of me to just say random things, to be honest. But I th what I know is that ratios, it's harder to get in graduate into medicine. A lot of people apply to the undergrad course, courses, even though they're graduate, because the numbers are better for them when they do apply for the undergrad one. So maybe that's something to look into. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's, that's that. And um, yeah, use all your connections because you're now a graduate, if you're a graduate entry medicine applicant, like you definitely have people who have been through university, which you might have not have had previous years ago. 
Um, and so make sure you try and use your connects as much as possible, whether that be for help with personal statements and interviews or whether that be through getting work experiences and things like that. So you just know a little bit more, you're much more mature and that should give you the confidence as well because um, that will make you a great doctor. So that'll be good. Sorry, I couldn't answer your question um, further there, but um, yeah, do just have a look at the websites out there. Would you be open to writing a book? If so, what kind? Wow, that's a great question. So a friend of mine had actually asked me that last week and I said to him, no, I'm not someone, I didn't think that I wanted to write a book, um, but now you've asked me, I, I mean, like if the opportunity came, I'm sure I'd be happy to try. But I think what's happened with medicine is that my writing skills have decreased year on year because I have not kept practicing just like I haven't done blog posts. I've just been writing a few things on social media or there. That's it. Like if you can keep your writing up, um, definitely do so, especially if you like writing. Another aspiring medic, that's something I'd recommend. I realized how deficient I was when I was in my global health year and I was writing essays and I was enjoying it so much. And I was like, oh, my God, I missed out on this in so many years. Um, but yeah. I think if it was to writing a book, I think at this point, I remember talking to my friends um, last week is that I'm going to be in F1, F2 and all these stories that are going to come out of it are going to be absolutely hilarious and eye opening and interesting. And it's just life um, as an F1, F2 is just so, so different. Like, yeah. Um, and like, uh, yeah, Chronicles book of like oh, the interesting stuff not like scientifically interesting, just like stuff, funny things and insights and reflections um, on like medical career and like the struggles within it in F1, F2 especially could be something that's worthwhile looking into. Um, I don't think, I think there might be a gap in the market for that. But um, as I said, I haven't thought about that. And more than anything, it's that time to actually make and create a book is very um, difficult. And at this age, at the age of like, what, 24, I don't think I have any life experiences that I can really put in a book. Um, but there's really amazing books out there. So yeah, so we'll see. All right, so I've got another question. Um, I've got a few other questions coming in. Just going back to it, Dreams of a Medic has a booklet with a breakdown of all the graduate entry courses and shows all the entry requirements and what a specific entrance exam is needed at UCAT campus. Like, Roshan, I don't know why I did refer this question on to you. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to need a grad officer on this med mentor team ASAP, so we'll see. Um, Roshan, thank you so much. I will note that down as well because there's loads and loads of people do come to me asking about, and med mentor in general, asking um, us about graduate entry medicine because I don't think there is any enough out there. Um, but it's good to see that there's things like Dreams of a Medic who have um, started to change the game with this, which is great. And Medical Schools Council, of course. Thank you so much, Roshan. You are amazing. Yes, MX Lad C. Roshan is a med is a soon to be medical student after graduate entry, so she knows her stuff. Um, whatever she says is gold at this moment in time. I don't think there's a better time to teach other people or give advice than after you've just been through what they're about to go through. Um, and I think Roshan, you're the epitome of that. So, like for example, a consultant telling someone how to get into med school uh, or how to revise for med school exams is probably not as good as um, someone just who has just gone through med school applications or has just gone through med school. So yeah, um, things like that. Never undervalue yourself. All right, cool. Another aspiring medic here for me to spill the tea is what do you do when you are in placement and you feel and you feel out of place? Um, I think that's one of those times where you either just sink or swim. And I think, um, so med medical students, their time, um, so a lot of people do say that medical students' times are, aren't valued enough and that actually we are chucked on things for no reason and we spend our time on placement doing a lot of things kind of for no reason or just waste our time there. Um, and I knew about all that type of thinking before I started clinical placement. So what I did is make sure I had my iPad with me with all my notes and or a textbook or, or like question banks or whatever. And any time that I was wasting, I would be trying to go on that and sort my life out revision wise and not waste it or go to the library at that point. And I think that comes down to what I do if I feel out of place. If I do feel out of place you know, on placement, I would initially try to kind of um, ask a few questions to first of all, 
kind of get myself in by asking questions people would normally like answering especially medics especially medics who like answering like scientific questions so like oh that's interesting well but then how does this work and they'll be like oh my god they'll love talking to you about like whatever like whether that be that per the personal stuff or like the scientific stuff side of medicine um so yeah ask questions if you're feeling out of place um just to try and form some sort of connection if you have no idea what's going on in your over your head ask for help man like at the end of the day the doctor is there in front of you and they are in charge of your teaching and they are paid to to have teaching as part of their job because they're part of a teaching hospital and so they should be doing their best to include you if you if you still feel they're not including you then obviously like in my instances i've been in places where like i know the doctor really does not care i'm there and doesn't really teach me anything i just go to the library and learn my stuff there and then go to my next placement or find another doctor that will help me in other ways um and come back on another day like there's so many like clinics there's so many theaters there's so many uh ward rounds there's like so many opportunities um just because that one scenario didn't work for you um doesn't mean you can come back and refresh um yeah so yeah that's what i would say so a few tactics here or there i hope that has helped um this will all be these are questions that you're asking in advance which is so great like that you're even thinking about these things i didn't even think that was a thing i, I don't even know i don't know what i imagined med school to be like i'll be honest with you i don't even know anymore i think i just thought it was parties or something um yeah try my best with the tips i think with these practical ones i think i'm quite um i we've all had experiences with that and i think i've definitely reflected on my experiences on placement some can be really good and some can be really bad and sometimes you're just like fine allow it like i'll just leave that's okay um i remember obviously now because of covid you can't do this but when it came to like um theater lists and like being part of like a surgical team i remember some doctors were really really good and some weren't and so if i was part of a surgery surgical team that really didn't i didn't click with like they just didn't include me or teach me or anything then i would say sorry but i'm going to leave if that's okay um and i'll see you later and i joined another surgery once the other surgeon was happy for me to go so yeah um yeah yeah that is to be fair as well um <laughs> yeah it is a lot of fun to be honest don't worry med school is fun and games as well as all the hard stuff in between cool your local aspiring medic has asked me a nice question here so do you have any support for oxbridge applicant applicant or know anyone that can help so i think whatever we have on the website is what we have in terms of support for that i think there are a few um places that do help with oxbridge applications um definitely look at their widening participation um schemes and societies um and um i think like the sutton trust do like summer schools and things like that and unique have a summer school so these are things that you can definitely apply for that will help for your oxbridge application and knowing more about it obviously it would be great to talk to an oxbridge medic so maybe try and find them via linkedin or something and have a and have a conversation with them um i think the oxbridge support for oxbridge applicant i think the main reason why you need support for oxbridge applicant is when you apply for uh when you first get when you get an interview because obviously their interviews are very different when it comes to everything else generally they really um do take the medical application like everyone else does with the bmat and the ucat so like for example you need to smash the bmat for oxford or you need to really do well in the bmat like at least middle for cambridge as well as all the other things on top so um so that's so what so what i'd say there is that you just need to maximize your scores in the entrance exams and like do everything that you'd normally do for your work experiences and personal statements but then when it comes to the interview that's when you need that support so i'll be very much later down the line um so if you want to ask oxbridge medics questions about their stuff go to their open day or like i think they now don't might, might not have open days but they might have virtual open days where you can ask them questions uh, on like that virtual platform um i'm sure they'll have webinars and seminars here or there so definitely have a look out for that just to give you an idea of what medicine um as at oxbridge looks like um yes yeah, so yeah just have a look at all these things cool sorry i couldn't help further but i think yeah with with support for oxbridge applications i think is very much um to do with more the interview stuff is what i was just saying that's the bottom line okay ah uh, okay so oxbridge applications and the personal statement 
could be a little bit more scientific oriented. That could be true. I'm not sure how they're looking at it these days, but when I applied um, our personal statement that you'd, I mean, I, I think I remember when speaking to people in Oxbridge was like, the end of the day, you're applying for four medical schools. So make sure your personal statement is good for all four med schools. So you can't have purely scientific stuff in it. Um, maybe you could say you're more curious about some certain aspects of science and you've done this or that, like research stuff. But that research stuff will be good for a normal medicine um, like application um, to any other med school as well across the country. So I wouldn't worry too much about the personal statement. Keep it to how you would. Uh, how you would. Um, uh, but with the interview, I think that's where it's very academic orientated. And I would say definitely... Um, get some support on that closer to the time. Okie dokie. Do we have any other questions coming in? All right, let me just recap a few other things that we've looked at before. So, yeah, so I think uh, we were talking about um, books and podcasts before. You guys have mentioned a few interesting uh, books and podcasts. I think uh, recently on Twitter, um, there's there's been the last week a few posts about Doctors Pay and um, Junior Doctors um in general not being paid enough um and then there were some i think not so um good comments about talking about other healthcare professionals like um and like how much they're earning um so these are interesting debates that med people in medical twitter are having or med twitter are having so um if you're not on twitter maybe worthwhile having a look just to give you a realistic view of what medicine is about I don't think um, when you t when it comes to pay in medicine. So sorry, I'm going on a bit of a tangent. Um, sorry, let me just double check. Actually, so blah blah blah. That's right. One of the biggest pieces of advice not telling you about is to do with like low supercurriculars and research. And they said that it would be eighty percent academic and twenty percent extracurricular. That's the ratio they advise for the person saying. Okay, uh, your local aspiring medic. I so yeah, I didn't know that that was. I mean, 80% academic and 20% extracurriculars, that is what normally, I th I mean, from my knowledge, 20% extracurriculars is one paragraph at the end saying what your hobbies, interests, sports and stuff are. That's what in a normal medicine personal statement you'd have. And the other 80% would be your uh, your academic, like um, ac your academic like thought process to medicine. So whether that be reading articles, going on work experiences, going volunteering, like I didn't think it would be to do with writing anything scientific. Bear in mind as well, in Cape, for Cambridge, you have to write a separate personal statement on top of your personal statement after you apply. So like after the 15th of October deadline, they give you like a form where they go, please submit another personal statement. That's very much more scientific. Um, so definitely. So I don't know about that advice, obviously, whatever that means. But I think take academic, academic to mean something um I, in my opinion meant more like oh to do with work experiences and stuff um but i i yeah just yeah sorry i don't have much more but that's my interpretation of it if that helps at all um yeah so we uh, so yeah, as i was talking about um a few things uh before we go actually we've got last 10 minutes so feel feel free to drop your last questions in um <coughs> so yes um i, I think roshan asked really early on um what's happened in the last week so a lot of us um finding your med students found got our match offers so like we've matched to like a hospital within a deanery now and we've got our jobs and our rotations for f1 and f2 which is super super exciting i got uh the hospital of my choice and one of my um rotations of choice which was really really like it's really amazing to have that at the end of your six years to know like wow okay I've got a job ready as soon as I pass my little finals exams and then I'll be like whoo I'll be a doctor in this specific ward um, from this specific day and I'll go on so I'll be in a uh, I'll, so for myself for people that are interested um, I think I'll be in a hospital in Essex um, near my house which was important the hospital itself was what I know was um, from speaking to other years like NF1, F2 was quite a supportive hospital with the right amount of like support as well as independence and like the working atmosphere amongst doctors is pretty good and social so these are things that I was looking for in a hospital um, I then got my placements in my F2 year that I was really looking forward to of like A&E, acute and psych so those were very generalist and things that I could apply to my future career as a 
GP and early on I've got surgery like trauma orthopedics general and then gas vascular and then I've got gastro medicine so it's like um so I'm really looking forward to it because it's a very it's F1 and F2 in my head is very much about learning as much as I can in those two years about hospital medicine about medicine and the practicalities of it um, and getting outside of med school and actually applying that and being an actual doctor which would be hopefully nice even though it's a lot of ward work and um, in terms of like writing and doing like admin stuff um, like it's still a learning opportunity and learning how doctors work within these environments which is great um, and thank you guys so much uh, for your congratulations I really appreciate that um, yeah so it's exciting time and so that tells you when you guys are at the start of your journey um, in five six years time you're going to be on the other side of it and you're going to be out oh, well okay so we've just done five or six years of med school and you're like whoa i'm going to be a doctor um do you think you would try to swap any of your allocations or are you happy to stick with what you've been given um so i think in in my deanery and most deaneries across the country you normally stick to what you've been given and you can't swap apart from in london and maybe in certain places like in scotland or wales um, but don't quote me on that obviously it could change as well but yeah I'm happy with mine and I think it's medicine is medicine I don't really have I spoke to people in years above um, that were in that hospital and I was like okay so which hospital what is good and bad more than anything else just for my working life so hopefully the ones that I've gone for are pretty okay um, some of them are going to be very tough placements but I know that already like for example A&E and the rotor but I also know that A&E is where you learn the most even though it is the most difficult in that sense um so yeah i'm just excited for it which is um exactly what you want at the end of a long long six years and no elective and yeah so th those are a few things um and if you guys have any other questions feel free to drop them now because i'm gonna head in about five minutes and i'm gonna close off with a few things so do you recommend doing the epq for medicine that's a good question amna i'd say go for it if you want to do it I have a topic that you might be interested in and you have the time to do it right don't sacrifice your a levels and your as level stuff for the epq because it's not the same thing the epq is just like a, another extracurricular um and it can be interesting for some and it can be difficult for others it won't definitely get you into med school but it will maybe help your application out you might talk about an interview you can put it in your personal statement link it to a few things that you're interested in um yeah so i'd say if you've got the opportunity you want to do it you've got the time do it if you are apprehensive and don't want to do it don't do it that's fine like i know loads of people that didn't go into didn't, that got into med school like myself without doing an epq like i didn't get um i didn't get a choice to be honest probably would have taken it um but yeah it will give you a good a good idea of how you'd research stuff for undergraduate um like courses in university anyway so that really does i think that would really be a good insight of the level of information and work you're going to be doing in the next few years so it can only be a plus in my opinion in that sense um cool so those are the last few questions i think before i go um so the in the last week uh, it's, it's funny it's like bringing med twitter into instagram so um so med twitter is like a thing where all the doctors and medics and medical students in the uk are kind of like part of um, just on Twitter and just talking about things. So I think something that came up recently was about doctor's pay and how doctor's pay is not enough. However, the tweet itself was now being put down was more about things like actually comparing our pay to other healthcare professionals, which um, in a lot of people's opinions is probably not good um uh, not good to do because you're working in a team and you don't want to be comparing yourself to other people in the team and then comparing your value etc i think the borderline thing from that entire twitter thread was that if you want money um and you are in um you, if you want money medicine really really is not um the one at this moment in time is very much gives you a stable job though and that's something definitely worthwhile especially in the post-covid era um I, or like covid era so that's something to think about but the reason why i bring this up is because in work experiences that i've been uh, that i did when i was in year 11 12 and 13 i remember doctors going to me run now um they said don't do this job um it doesn't have any money for the amount that you work um for your academic ability or whatever and i remember like doctors consultants saying to me listen i went to cambridge did medicine and all my friends now have like penthouse apartments and like an amazing life blah blah, blah with loads of money and i was like at that time being 17 thinking ah, it's all right i don't i don't need that or whatever 
but um so just before i head off i'd like to say make sure you consider um what money means to you in your career it's not a dirty thing to want money in your life um and i think that's something that is very much especially as people who are english um kind of fed to us that like at the end of the day it's not about the money at all but obviously it comes to a point where your 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 value of your job is the amount of money that's given to you so that's not me on a rant that's just me telling you guys to definitely research the careers out there there is uh, a lot to do with medicine and other allied healthcare professionals as well as other fields that you could maybe enjoy um that might have more money or less and have other perks I, I don't know. So that's just um, something to bear in mind, um, seeing as there's a debate that started to kick off again. And I think in the next few years, you'll be seeing a lot more junior doctors talking about pay and the lack of it. Um, as we've already spoken about, I think in previous sessions, how the NHS are having only like a 1% pay rise or something in England for most healthcare workers. Um, like loads of, in the middle of a pandemic, loads of things to uh, think about there. Um, and maybe we can talk about that in the next few weeks' episodes um, when we are back on Med Mentor Live. Okay, right. So um, I think what I'm going to say here is I'm not going to be here in the next few weeks because I've got finals exams coming up, so I'll be uh, busy revising for those. However, I'll be back in, I think, like sometime in the first week of May, just looking at my calendar, some somewhere around there. But Med Mentor, I'm sure, will be back with either next week or the week after. Um, with uh, another weekly clinic live keep um, up to date on our instagram posts um, uh, because we'll keep you guys up to date with all of that go on our website for any of the resources that we have all free to use and please do share us share us with all your friends and people that you know applying to med school thank you guys so much for your questions it's been an absolute pleasure thank you amna thank you another spying medic roshin um, and everyone who's asked us questions like your local aspiring medic for joining us and all and everyone of the sort it's been absolutely amazing. Um, it's been, I uh, hope you guys have a good weekend. And yes, best of luck. Thank you so much. Another minute. Hopefully I'll see you guys on the other side. Where I'll be refreshed, less stressed and closer to becoming hopefully a doctor, right? Um, as we all want to do over here, which will be great. Um, cool. Thank you guys so much. Take care of yourselves um, in, uh, in the next few weeks and I'll see you all very soon. All right. Bye guys.